Good afternoon. Uh, we are beginning the second day of the conference dedicated to uh, the decoloniality and the biennials, and it's the final fourth part of the public pro program of the Ukrainian Pavilion. My name is Titana Filevska, I'm creative director of the Ukrainian Institute and co-curator of the public program. For those who are with us in person in Venice, uh, we just saw um, a beautiful film by an Indian artist, Ohida Kandahar, uh, who is a visual artist and a filmmaker living between Kolkata and Delhi. And she is working a lot with her, um, um, uh, the vicinity like personal memory, marginalized voices, collective trauma, and also nonlinear story, stories interacting with various cultural layers of society. And her film, uh, Dream, Dream Your Museum was part of the Berlin Biennial this year, which was fully dedicated to the issue of decoloniality. Unfortunately, because of the copyright reasons, this part, the film was not available for online stream, and unfortunately, our online um, guests and online viewers um, cannot share that experience with us, but we will refer to the film and use it in our further discussion. Today's, uh, uh, today's work will have two parts. For the two parts, uh, it will be a lecture and a following discussion. And uh, this, will, uh, this part will wrap up the um, program which lasted um, from April throughout the whole duration of the biennial. Um, and now uh, I would like to invite on this stage uh, our next speaker, the lecturer, um, um, Hanna Rudik, who is a Ukrainian museum curator and educator. She has been working in the Hanenko Museum in Kyiv for the past 20 years. Um, Hanna uh, is a curator of Islamic collection at the Kyiv um, Art uh, Kyiv Museum uh, and is currently hosted by the Technical University of Berlin and supported by Alexander von Humboldt Foundation for her research project on the colonization of U U European museums of Islamic and Asian art concepts and practices. And today, um, Hanna will introduce her lecture uh, about the history behind the Russian pavilion at the Venice Biennial, uh, titled Russian Pavilion in Venice, the Hanenko Gambit. Um, Hanna, please, the floor is yours, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Tatiana, for your generous intro. Thank you very much, personally, and the Ukrainian Institute for this um, so important, so essential program on decoloniality and decolonization. <clears throat> Dear esteemed friends and colleagues, I would like to bring to your attention today one of the key histories behind, of, behind the pavilions for us Ukrainians. Outside this history, we can no longer think on the connections between Ukraine and the Venice Biennale. This is a story about the Russian pavilion built at the expense of the prominent Ukrainian Kulturträger, Bogdan Hanenko. I have not found in Ukraine archival materials on this event. There is no doubt, doubt that some documents were in the Hanenko's archive, but this archive disappeared without a trace uh, a week after Varvara Hanenko's death in May 1922. The most part of the documents on the pavilion are in Russia. In 2014, one of the R Russian museums published selected letters and other materials on the pavilion from state and private archives. So we know the factual framework of the story. In short, in 1913, Bogdan Hanenko, listed in Russian publication as a Russian industrialist and philanthropist, a honorary member of the Imperial Academy of Arts, offered the honorary president of the mentioned academy, Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, a donation in the amount of uh, 31,000 rubles for the development of the project construction, furnishing, furnishing, and further maintenance of the Russian pavilion in Venice. The donation was gratefully accepted, and the pavilion designed by Alexei Shusev was opened in 1914. 
Most interesting questions for me in this story are why and what for? Why and what for, Bogdan Hanenko, one of the key drivers of the cultural development of Kyiv and Ukraine at the end of the 19th, first decades of the 20th century, why and what for did he voluntarily pay for the creation of the Russian pavilion for the Venice Biennale? For all the impressive breadth of the Hanenko's interests in, as art connoisseurs and collectors, they were not particularly interested in modern art, which was then a contemporary art. What prompted them to offer this donation? Today I will consider this question within the broader context of the cultural and public, uh, political situation in the sub-Russian cave and from the point of view of the personal Kultur Kulturträgers strategy of the Hanenkos. But let me start with a very basic question of who were Bogdan and Varvara Hanenko. I can't switch it ahead. Can I? Please, staff, technical assistance, could you help me? Oh, yes, finally. OK. Bogdan Hanenko was a descendant of an old and well-known Ukrainian Cossack family, which in the first half of the 17th century received noble privileges from the Polish king, Jan II Kazimierz Vasa. Bogdan's ancestor, Mikhail Hanenko, was a hetman of the Right Bank Ukraine in the 17th century, and a well-known politician and historian was Mykola Hanenko, the general Korunji of the Zaporozhian army and a famous memoirist of the 18th century. Bogdan's uncle, Mikhail and Alexander Hanenko, were active public figures, intellectuals, and collectors of Ukrainian antiquities. So Bogdan, Bogdan's childhood in the family estate in Chernigov region, was spent among educated and socially active people keen in the Ukrainian theme. After graduating from the law faculty of Moscow University, Hanenko started his juridical career in St. Petersburg. It was there and then, as he later recalled in his memories, quote, that my vocation was determined. I irrevocably decided to study old painting and collect works of it, end quote. In summer 1874, Bogdan Hanenko married Varvara Tereshchenko. She was the elder daughter of Nikola Tereshchenko, an emerging sugar tycoon of Ukraine. Extremely successful businessmen, the Tereshchenkos became new nobility in 1870 due to Nikola's generous philanthropic projects. Striving for the public good, read the motto on their coat of arms. In the era of rising social national awareness of the Ukrainian elite, the Tereshchenkos were among the leaders of this movement. Seeking to adopt an aristocratic style of life, Nikola and other members of the family started collecting art. So Varvara was surrounded not just by nouveau riche, but also new passionate amateurs and patrons of art. Along with love for arts, she absorbed the Tereshchenkos' inherent traditions of charity. These two predispositions, her sensitivity to art and to charity, had key impact upon her life path and shaped their common with Bogdan Hanenka future museum, vision and action. From 1880s on, the Hanenkos were actively collecting arts and antiquities. Vienna, Berlin, Paris, Madrid, Warsaw, Rome, Florence, Harbin and Cairo were by no means complete geographies in their, of their exploratory travels and their correspondence with the European leading art connoisseurs. Cornelis Hofstede de Groot, Abraham Bridius, Wilhelm von Bode, Max Jacob Friedlander, these and other key Western art historians were their consultants. In his letter uh, of 1897, Bogdan Hanenko was, tells about his contact with Wilhelm von Bode a number one German art historian called Bismarck of German museums. Quote, J'étais à Berlin, j'ai présenté à M. Baudet deux de mes tableaux attribués à Rembrandt. Après les, après les avoir bien examinés, il est attribué au maître lui-même. End quote. I've been to Berlin and I presented to Mr. Baudet two my, of my paintings by Rembrandt, attributed to Rembrandt, and after he had examined them well, he had attributed them to the master himself. The Hanenko's collection began with European fine art, however, sensitively following the new trends of both intellectual fashion 
and the art market. In the first decade of the 20th century, uh, the Hanenkos had a classical Western universal art collection. In addition to the European art and that of classical antiquity, uh, it included archaeology of ancient Egypt, rare pieces of pre-Islamic and med medieval per Persian art, artistic treasures of Byzantium and Ottoman Turkey, European and Asian historical arms and armor, as well as applied art, collections of art from Japan, China, India, and other Asian cultures. The thoroughness and breadth of their interest in the history of world art is evidenced by the impressive collection of books on art history of about 3,000 volumes, up to now preserved in the Hanenko Museum. Uh, the Hanenko's decision to settle in Kyiv for permanent residence was and is of crucial importance to Ukraine. True citizens of Europe, they traveled more than stayed in Kyiv, having their own apartments in both Russian capitals and numerous estates. But they chose Kyiv as their home that meant, first of all, the home of their art collection. These two, uh, 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 Nikola Tereshchenko, actually Varvara's father, played a decisive role in this epoch-making decision. He and his family made exactly the same choice, choice, choice for Kyiv in the mid-1870s, after a short uh, stay in Moscow. And it was Nikola who, in 1875, purchased two plots of land in the new Card Street opposite the university and built on one of them an elegant mansion that he later gave to his daughter, Varvara, and his son-in-law. This is how the Hanenko's mansion looked in initially before reconstruction redoing it in 1891. So at the end of the 1880s, the Hanenkos moved to Kyiv, where they joined the community of intellectuals, art lovers, and philanthropists. Their collection expanded soon with a new section on Ukraine. Their interest in archaeology and generous funding of excavations allowed them to eventually make up an archaeological collection, unique in its value and completeness. The collection included artifacts found in Ukraine at day and dating from the Stone Age to the Scythian era and to the era of Great Migration, up to the period of Slavic settlement in the Dnipro region, including first centuries of Christianity. There were also objects from the Greek colonies of the Black Sea coast. In 1890s, collections of old Ukrainian icons and the so-called Cossack antiquities, uh, from the 15th century to 18th century, the period prior to Russian domination of Central and Eastern Ukraine, entered the Hanenko's collection. At the beginning of the 20th century, the division of Ukrainica was further replenished with a large and diverse collection of Ukrainian folk art and traditional household items. In 1896, Bogdan Hanenko headed the board of the Tereshchenko Brothers Sugar and Refinery Company, a large industrial syndicate with tens millions of turnover and huge surplus profits. Actually, it was then that the Hanenkos became really wealthy people. Their capabilities as collectors and patrons reached a new level. The first decade of, the, of their cave period was also a time of their evolution from art amateurs and private collectors to leading builders of public culture in Kyiv. It is important to remind that the last decades of the 19th century was a difficult time for Ukrainian culture. Imperial authorities, afraid of Ukrainian separatism, harshly suppressed any sprouts of national development. Book printing in Ukrainian was banned, as well as Ukrainian press and Ukrainian theater. Despite the growing interest of na in national history and culture among the Ukrainian social elite, until the very end of the 19th century, there was no public museum in Kyiv. And to the appeal of Ukrainian intellectuals and philanthropists, the imperial bodies responded, I quote, there is no need for such an institution, end of quote. For the empire, he was and should have continued to remain a provincial colonial city, a land without its own memory, its own identity, and its own narrative. In 1897, Bogdan Hanenka in fact headed the newly created Kyiv Society for Antiquities and Arts, the purpose of which was to organize a city public museum. Hanenka managed to obtain personal permission for the museum from the Emperor of Russia, Nikolai II. 
During the visit of the imperial family to Kiev, Hanenko organized an inspection by the emperor, the empress, and the grand duke of the site of the future museum. Also, as a leader of the project, he received a donation from the state treasury in the amount of 100,000 rubles for the construction of the building. And here you see the building that was constructed. In total, Hanenko raised about 250,000 rubles for the erection and furnishing of the museum building. In addition, he encouraged key Ukraine antiquities collectors to donate objects to the museum. The Tereshchenkos brought then a unique, bought then a unique archaeological collection made up by the leading cave archaeologist, Czech biologian Vikenty Hoika. All in all, the donated collections were estimated in 140,000 rubles, and the Hanenkos only themselves donated 3,145 items of Ukrainian archaeology worth about 71,000 rubles. These all figures testify to the scale of the museum movement in Ukraine at the turn of the century, as well as to the extraordinary intellectual, moral, and organizational, organizational skills and moral devotion of Bogdan Hanenko. On this old photo from the National Art Museum of Ukraine's archive, you can see the first exhibition of Ukrainian archaeology, opened in the newly built city museum yet in 1899 for the 11th All-Russian Archaeological Summit in Kyiv, also organized by Bogdan Hanenko. These collections were donated to the museum by the Hanenkos and the Tereshchenkos. Varvara Hanenko had her personal share of contribution to the first museum. At the beginning of the 20th century, she became an activist of the Ukrainian handicraft movement, inspired by the European arts and crafts movement and called by the idea of preserving and developing the traditions of Ukrainian folk art. In 1904, in her estate Olenivka in Kyiv region, she founded a college and a manufacturer for traditional Ukrainian carpet weaving and fabric printing, where she invited Vasil Krychevsky, a Ukrainian modernist artist and a deep connoisseur of folk traditions, as an instructor. Besides, she enthusiastically studied herself and collected works of traditional art, carpets, embroidery, clothes, ceramics, and tempered glass. And in 1906, she participated with her collection in the first ever exhibition of Ukrainian folk art in the first city museum. Here on this photo from the archive of the National Museum of Ukrainian Folk and Decorative Art, you can see Varvara Hanenko as we think, this is Varvara Hanenko. Sitting to the far left, among other organizers of the folk art exhibition, including well-known collectors, researchers, and educators, as Olena Pchilka, Vasil Kryczewski, Mykola Bielaszewski, Vadim Szerbakivski, Vikenty Hoika, Kostmoschenko. Over the next several years, Varvara Hanenko donated about 1,200 items of folk art and ethnography to the first museum collection. And here, uh, most of these objects donated by her are kept today by the National Museum of Folk and Decorative Art in Kyiv. For instance, this beautiful Poltava region carpet of the 19th century. It is important to emphasize now the fact that Varvara Hanenko's active role in the creation of the first city museum was only recently reconstructed, still very fragmentarily. As everywhere else in the Russian Empire, essentially male-centric modern culture, and particularly its culture of memory, had prioritized men, relegating women to the margins of just outside the framework of official history. Therefore, Varvara Hanenko is so conspicuously absent in the official history of the Venice Pavilion. Today, thanks to the painstaking archival research of the last decade, we have every reason to talk about the collection, the ideas, and the decisions, not of Hanenko, but of the Hanenkos. To sum up the story about the Hanenkos' immense intellectual, moral, and material contribution into Ukrainian cultural heritage, I will just say that today, five key national museums of Kyiv that is besides the Hanenko Museum. You see all them on the slide. 
He parts of the former Hanenko's collection, and until 24th of February this year, they presented their shares at the key areas of their permanent displays. Most of these museums were created already in the Soviet period as a result of division of the first city museum holdings. So, the first public museum in Kyiv was officially opened and consecrated in December 1904, and please pay attention to its full name, Sovereign Emperor Nikolai Alexandrovich Art, Industrial and Scientific Museum. The goal that Ukrainian elite failed to achieve in 1880s was achieved by Bogdan Hanenko, a member of the Imperial Archaeological Commission, a corresponding member of the Moscow Imperial Archaeological Society, a honorary member of the Imperial Academy of Arts, since 1906 a member of the State Council of Russia from industrialists, a member of the right-centered pro-monarchist party of the Octoberists, since 1908 an actual state councillor of the Russian Empire, and sometimes in those years he also became a member of the St. Petersburg Freemasons Lodge of the Interparliamentary Union. Hanenko's affiliation with countless imperial political and public structures and communities, his personal direct contacts with the imperial family, initiated and supported by him at every opportunity. The members of imperial family were listed as honorary members of all commissions and committees that were headed by Hanenko. And finally, the long and awkward official name of the First City Museum honoring the sovereign emperor, the name that Hanenko insisted on. All the systematic and articulated loyalty to the empire was, in my opinion, a rationally constructed strategy. In all these official roles in Moscow and Petersburg, according to the recent archival research data, he did almost nothing. See, during the years of being a member of the State Council of Russia, he only once brought up some minor issue for discussion. There is no information about his activities as a member of the Octoberist Party or as a Freemason. It looks that in all these communities, Hanenko was just visibly and sometimes financially present, while he was actively present in Kyiv, investing here or there in Kyiv, his lifetime, his knowledge, and his energy. It is not by chance that Moscow also has named him in a book Russian industrialist and philanthropist. The official imperial archives could clearly testify precisely to this identity of Hanenko. This double identity, or rather the second constructed pro-imperial identity of Hanenko, provided him with the necessary resource of, resource of trust of the highest imperial officials, and consequently with the necessary degree of freedom allowing him to make important changes in Kyiv. Proofs that Hanenko's pro-imperial identity was a mask rather than sincere servility can be found in his letters to Hvedir Volk, or Theodor Volkov, an eminent Ukrainian archaeologist, archaeologist and anthropologist, a member of all Kyiv community, Starakyivska Hromada. Like other members of Hromada community, Volkov was persecuted for his Ukrainophile activities and was forced to emigrate to France. Bogdan Hanenko's letters, preserved in the archive of the Institute of Archaeology in Kyiv, mostly deal with various specific issues of Ukrainian history and archaeology. In one of these letters of 1900, Hanenko wrote to Vogue about the rich treasure of the Grand Prince's era, found in Kyiv shortly before that, and consisting of golden objects decorated with enamels. I quote, Regarding the treasure found in Kyiv, I have sent to your disposition photos of the main items. It is premature and dangerous, to announce a new find in Russia, as they can claim it to St. Petersburg. That happened." End of quote. The extraction of cultural heritage was a common practice in the Russian Empire. The most valuable art and history objects found in different sites were claimed and seized by Hermitage, the main museum of the metropolis. Hanenko, like other Ukrainian collectors, consciously and covertly resisted this, to this colonial policy, keeping Ukrainian heritage in Ukraine. 
Hanenko's dual identity seemingly fits into the concept of colonial mimicry, coined by a post-colonial Indian-American thinker Homi Baba in his famous essay of mimicry and man. Baba considers mimicry as a constant and unconscious attempt of a colonized to imitate a, imitate a colonizer. This, I quote, being the same but not quite, end quote, finally becomes a tool of subversion in normative discourse and disrupting the authority of a dominant. However, Hanengo's it looks imitated loyalty consciously, very pragmatically. Imitation was a key tool of his well-calculated strategy. A man of sharp, insightful mind, rational to the core, in my opinion, the common truism about Hanenko the Romantic is completely pointless. He thoroughly studied the rules of the empire and brilliantly played by them. Anticipating and surpassing, surpassing expectations, he presented to the empire a figure of its sweetest dream, a perfect subject, the ideal little Russian, impeccably benevolent and delightfully sensitive to the subtlest nuances of imperial desire. One of these nuances was the hierarchy of museums. Museums of world history and world art that were museums that shaped and shared big global narratives could exist only in the capitals in Moscow and St. Petersburg. The centers of the provinces were also allowed to have museums, although, as we know, not all of them. But these provincial museums were supposed to be museums, museums of local content, local art, local history, local nature. This important political principle, the knowledge of which I thankfully owe to the Ukrainian museum historian Mykola Mykolaevich Bileshivsky, who is, by the way, a grandson of the Hanenko's companion, the director of the first cave museum, famous archaeologist and art historian Mykola Fedotovich Bileshivsky. This principle could explain why in his keynote speech at the opening of the museum, Hanenko suddenly mentions collections of soils, minerals, metals, which in fact were not in that museum. With this imaginary naturalistic aspect of the new created museum, Hanenko presumably camouflaged its too obvious Ukrainian history focus, as the text of speech was intended for publication. So the new key museum would perform or fit into the narrow frame of what was allowed for a province. As said, this strategy of conscious mimicry proved to be efficient. It allowed Hanenko to do what no one else could do before him. But of course, not all the Hanenko's contemporaries understood and supported him. In the context of the Hanenko's strategic dual identity in relations with the empire, Bogdan's voluntary offer, voluntary offer to sponsor the Russian pavilion for the Venice Biennial looks very logical. The situation by 1913 turned out to be very favorable, including the resounding success of Dagalev in Venice in 1907, followed by the visit of the Russian emperor in 1909, the ongoing parades of pavilions, and the ardent desire of the August patroness of the Imperial Academy of Arts to implement the idea of the pavilion for which she had already chosen a plot of, of land in Venice. And on the other hand, the lack of funds and the self-humiliating rejection of the idea by the Academy Board in 1912. All these circumstances shaped the momentum for, the, for Hanenko to step onto the stage. In January 1913, he wrote a letter to Grand Duchess. Yes. Your Imperial Highness, respectfully, respectfully bowing to your untiring and heartfelt service to Russian art and endeavoring to come to the assistance of your energetic activities and so on and so on, I came to the decision to place at your disposal, not at the disposal of the Imperial Academy of Arts, but at your disposal of 21,000 plus 10,000 rubles as capital and so on, your Imperial Highness most royal servant, Bogdan Hanenko. He was then immediately invited to a highest, highest audience and the matter was quickly settled. It is interesting the, the, that Hanenko's pragmatism in the case of the pavilion was obvious to Shchusev, 
the architect of the pavilion. In a letter to Fyodor Berenstein, the pavilion project manager, Shusev bitterly complains about Hanenko's refusal to allocate additional funds beyond the promised contribution. I quote, it is difficult to beat Hanenko, but if you promise him a Hofmeister, he will give another five or six or even 30,000. The highest level rank of Hofmeister entails significant privileges. Being awarded that this tile was equal to a high imperial award and was a sign of special personal favor of the royal family. According to my vision, to our vision, the favor of August family was the main strategic resource for the Hanenkos. Therefore, when in his next letter to Hanenkos, Chusev, as he himself later recalled, resorted to direct blackmail and threatened Hanenko to complain to the Grand Duchess, the tone of Ukrainian patron changed. Hanenko apologized and promised Shusev to give additional money. What did the Hanenkos plan to get from the empire for the price of this showy gift? For what new achievements did they so diligently strengthen the ground of trust in relation with ruling bodies? Why and what for was this new degree of freedom needed? My answer to this is for the Hanenko Museum in Kyiv. In 1913, the year of the donation to the pavilion, the Hanenkos already knew that they would leave their priceless world art collection on Tereshinkovska Street and that a new world art museum would be created in the exquisite mansion designed as a Venetian palazzo of the 18th century. The Museum of World Art in Kyiv. A museum of the type which only the metropolis had the right to have. The museum which was to become a symbol and the means of overcoming Kyiv's status of a cultural co colony. The new achievement of covert cultural revolution in Kyiv carried out by the Hanenkos. It required a particular credit of trust from the imperial authorities personal trust backed by personal affection, and the pavilion was supposed to establish this trust and this to ensure this affection. At the end of the 1913, in the Magazine of Art of Southern Russia, in the Chronicle section, a short announcement appeared, and it was the first public announcement of the idea. The Anne and the I, Hanenko, are going to establish an art museum of their name for which they are going to redo their house and rearrange their painting and objects of applied art in it, after which the museum to be bequest will be bequest to Kyiv and it will be maintained within the funds assumed from the special income house of donors. This is how the Hanenkos mentioned the Hanenko's private art gallery presenting one of the richest encyclopedic private collection of art on the territory of the whole Russian empire of the period, looked in 1910s when the pavilion was founded and the announcement was made. Just to have another view, another hall. The Hanenko Museum was established, although Bogdan Hanenko didn't live to see its opening. The museum was born in 1919 in the difficult times of the previous Russian war in Ukraine. It was due to the personal strong will and faith of Varvara Hanenko, a lonely elderly woman who stayed in Kyiv to preserve the priceless cultural heritage in Ukraine and for Ukraine, when almost all her relatives and friends left for safety abroad. The Hanenko Museum in Kyiv concentrated the ultimate sense of her and Bogdan's lives. It brought together everything for which they lived, history and art of the world, knowledge and enlightenment, humanism and nobility of spirit, and the flourishing of culture in their native land. And the Russian pavilion in Venice was a timely tool to implement this ultimate sense. I believe that this topic will be further explored in depth and breadth. New documents will be found, studied, published, and discussed, which will support or undermine the proposed vision of the pavilion as a gambit of the Hanenkos, a term that in chess means a tactic sacrifice made to gain some important strategic advantage. 
pavilion was the Hanenko's gambit in the strategy of cultural resistance to the empire. These two buildings, so intimately interconnected within the personal history of the Hanenkos, the history of apparent loyalty and actual resistance, of hybrid identity and strategy of Ukrainian colonial subject. These two buildings are today even more tightly connected within the same history of imperialism. Both of them are physically empty now. Russia and its culture are today in the ultimate crisis of sense, run out of words and representations. And the Russian pavilion, twice forcefully seized by the successing quasi-empires, the Soviet Union and then the Russian Federation, cannot but be perceived today as a symbol of violence and narcissism, of imperialism, this heavy trauma of human civilization, a trauma that continues to deepen today. And the Hanenko Museum, so beautiful, so full of life and so vibrantly sensible. It had to empty its halls on February 24th, 2022. And on October 10th, 2022, the museum was physically injured as a result of a Russian missile strike that hit Kids playground located 50 meters from the historical Hanenko's mansion. Windows shattered, skylights fell down, cutting old museum parquet. One hundred and a few years ago, Varvara Hanenka stayed in Kyiv in the war time to implement ultimate human sense. This year, my colleagues, 95% women, choose to stay in Kyiv under shelling to save and protect this ultimate sense. This museum today stands as one of many symbols of Ukraine and of unquenchable faith in good future. The future of freedom, the future of justice, the future of humanness. And I think, think that for the sake of this future, for the sake of healing the countless injuries inflicted on humanity by empires and imperialism, a healing so much sought today by societies throughout the world. A project of the Hanenko Museum and other museums of Ukraine in collaboration with contemporary artists. A project rethinking the past, reinventing the present, and reimagining the future should be planned in the space of the Russian pavilion in Venice as a part of the next international art and architecture exhibition of La Biennale di Venezia. Thank you for your kindest attention.